and just really moving from that place of effort to non-effort, that place of Inquiry, self-inquiry is a practice and it's very useful to uh, give us an experience of our true nature. We drop the question into our awareness. And maybe at first when we engage the practice, we try to answer the question with our mind. All our ideas of ourself come up. But eventually we get tired of that. <laughs> we exhaust all our ideas. And in our exhaustion, we stop. And then in our stopping, something can reveal itself. Oh, that? That simplicity? That's what we're looking for? <clears throat> but there's also a usefulness to continue the practice after we begin to glimpse our true nature. And it starts having a different quality. There's less effort involved, there's less doing. Partly because the efforter or the doer begins to dissolve. <coughs> and partly because we just start coming into alignment with the natural inquiry that wants to happen on its own. We can say that inquiry is structured into consciousness. So whether we engage in a conscious practice of it or not, it doesn't really matter. The natural inquiry that I'm talking about is consciousness's inherent drive to know itself, to awaken to itself. And so as we begin to be able to rest as awareness more and more, combine as our true nature, what the natural inquiry tends to look like is something that doesn't know that yet begins to come to our awareness. Some contraction, some wound, some repressed energy or emotion that wasn't fully experienced it now comes to the light of our own consciousness. And so when we as consciousness begin to turn our eyes towards those parts of ourself that we've probably run away from our entire life, that's the essence of egoic consciousness. It's running away from what it doesn't like, from what's too painful. But the movement of awakening is to wake those parts up. And so a contraction comes up. Something's triggered in us. And we can feel the sense of, oh, now I've lost the openness. But if we just stay open and curious and just keep looking at it, we can ask it a question, of course, but more important is just to, to be open and curious. And usually, initially, what's revealed, I'm really talking about looking at, uh, at core patterns, core identities, the really sticky ones. So we begin to see its pattern, we begin to hear its story. We begin to see what it believes. It's usually some negative self-image, some sense of lack. 
and the more open and curious we become with these parts, then we begin to see what they're constructed out of. So, for example, a core pattern like I am a mother. These are all impersonal core patterns. Basically everybody has some version of them and there isn't that many. <laughs> some people will say there's only about 20 or 30 core patterns. And they sort of encompass all of the, the negative core story. And what these core patterns are constructed out of is some mixture of um, intense human emotions like fear, anger, Unresolved sadness, guilt, shame, self-hatred, apathy. Apathy, and apathy. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. There can be a place when we stay um, focused and open and curious where we begin to, mm, our own clarity sees past the negative core story, the negative core belief. It sees the emotion, but it doesn't get trapped in them. It, it looks even more intensely and deeply. And it's, um, you can't even separate the emotions anymore. It's just an energetic um, holding, we could say. I mean, if you stopped and kind of took a step back, you could pick out what the emotions are, or you could pick out the beliefs. Yeah, I want to ask if um, there's no story mm -hmm. or no experience. It's like, like pre, no, it's pre-verbal, so you don't have a story. And you, yeah, you don't have any memory. Great. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm speaking about. Okay. It's, um... It could I mean, be in the womb, you know, it could be in the womb or before that. Right, yeah. Absolutely. It seems to me there's no belief. Mm. There's no belief attached to that because you, you weren't thinking cognitively. Yet. I don't know. I'm just curious about the answer to that. <laughs> This is exactly what I'm not sharing about. Yeah, it's um, it's tuning into just the um, the raw energy of it, and oftentimes we we find when what's uh, what kind of drives us to that opening and to that revelation is uh, is moving into a, a a very sticky pattern, a very deep negative emotion. And it, it tends to be, when they're that deep and that negative, they tend to be pre-verbal, pre-cognitive. There's just a core contraction that's there. And again, we, we can slow the process down by um, looking for the story, or looking for what the emotions are, or looking for mm -hmm. a remembrance or memory of what experience precipitated that contraction. I mean, that's wonderful. Th those, those insights will be given to us spontaneously. But I'm talking about the place where you just, you're not really, that's not your prime directive anymore. You're not so interested in the story. You're not so interested in the emotions. It's just an energetic feel to it. And, and, and when it gets to that place, the intensity of emotion can be extreme. For, for people when they start going into core traumatic patterns, that'll be the place where the psyche fragments. That's where the psyche dissociates. And eventually, um, the integration of dissociation is um, waking up. That pattern wakes up, that contraction wakes up, and it's just simple. It's, it's, it's 
the intensity builds, the intensity builds, and at a certain point in the past, something broke in us, something fragmented in us. And as we move back into this place with consciousness, the intensity builds. <laughs> and so that's the staying with it, the curiosity, the openness that we need. Not getting caught by the mind stories, not getting caught by the emotions, feelings, not even getting caught by just the core sensation in the body. The core wound mm -hmm. is that's, that's its deepest resting place is the body. It's felt in the body. You can't always contact it cognitively, but you can feel it directly. You can feel that sense of aversion in the body. And so eventually, again, this isn't, uh, you can't effort at this level of intensity. You just have to do something and you just stops running. It's really a not doing, it's just a stopping. It's just, you're tired of moving away from that. And then you're stopping, you as consciousness. It just melts it, it just melts it. And then you see that demon in you, that part in your psyche that was that place that you were never supposed to go. Poof. And in its place is just space. And then in that space, that emptiness, that place that was deeply contracted, it's now revealed its true nature as formless consciousness. And then there's nothing in that pattern in that energy locked in the system. There's nothing, nothing left in it that is fueling aversion or attachment anymore. It's untied itself, poof, it's gone. And then in that emptiness is where the true gift of that part, the true beauty of that part is. When the contraction disappears, it now opens a portal to mm. the unity, to the love that's structured in. You can say within the emptiness, they're the same. At, at a certain point, you can't even make distinction any, anymore. Emptiness is form, form is emptiness. Emptiness is fullness, fullness is emptiness. Emptiness is love, love is emptiness. Eventually, you just stop giving it a name. <laughs> but, but it has a different uh, experiential quality. The love, there, there's a there's a, a quality of connection, unity. It's full. It's full as opposed to empty. It's empty of self, but it's it's complete. It's full. It's overflowing. That's the true gift. Is it overflows? It overflows. It overflows. Unconditional love. because there's no limit to it. There's no beginning, there's no end. He gives to everything.